from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. In March, we put forth our scenario about Uber for all, we called it, where a new breed of data apps was emerging. And we used Uber as an example where data about people, places, and things is brought together in a coherent real-time system. And the premise was that increasingly, organizations are going to want a digital representation of their business with incoming data informing the state of that business and then enabling actions in real time. This is Uber-like data apps for every company and the evolution of data apps for the masses that don't have 2,000 Uber software engineers at their disposal. Welcome to this special breaking analysis with Cube analyst George Gilbert and friend of the Cube, entrepreneur and executive Bob Muglia, former Microsoft, former Snowflake CEO, investor, and trend spotter. Welcome, Bob, George, good to see you guys. Thank you. Thanks. So, Bob, you just wrote a new book, uh, The Datapreneurs. It's out. Um, pretty, pretty detailed sort of history from your point of view. I particularly loved, I think it was chapter seven, a new type of operational database. We're going to get into some of that stuff today, but why, why did you write this book? Well, I thought there was something that I had to say and it'd be helpful for people to hear it, frankly. I mean, I was very fortunate to have a perspective of watching the data industry mature over really a 40 year period, if you go all the way back. And uh, I, uh, I've i watched what's happened in this industry and, and how the people that have been involved have really made such a difference. And, you know, we sort of see the AI world we're in today and the incredible things you can do. And people think it just sort of came about all at once. And in some senses, it certainly does seem like it did that. But there's a long history that sits behind that. And I thought it'd be useful for people to hear that story and understand how we got to where we are and, and give some idea where we're going in the future. Yeah, it's called, again, it's called the Datapreneurs. If you're into data and you kind of want to go deep um, from Bob's perspective, which is which is a unique one and, and, and really historical, intriguing one, you know, definitely check that out. All right, let's, let's hit the agenda today. Uh, Alex, if you bring it up here, we're going to look at you know, what data apps look like today, where they're headed and how the underlying data platform is going to evolve to accommodate the future of, of data apps. So uh, let's take a look at uh, the, the next slide, if you will, uh, Alex. We want to talk about the scope of today's data apps and the so-called modern data stack. You got ELT pipelines with, with things like DBT and Fivetran. Lake houses, we're always talking about Databricks and Snowflake, they're two of our favorite examples, but you got BigQuery, you know, we just came off of Google Next and it was very data centric, obviously AI centric. Azure Fabric now is sort of this new interesting entrant into the market. Whatever we can make of AWS's sort of bespoke set of data tools, but they're a player. And then you got the BI layer on top of that. Bob, how would you describe today's modern data platforms in terms of the stack and the scope of applications that they support. You know what, as you just, as you pointed out, David, there's really five platforms right now that different vendors are building that are all viable choices for people to build a, a modern data solution on top of. And I think the characteristics of all of them is that they all leverage the cloud for, for full scale. You know, they can support data of multiple types. And now we're beginning to see in addition to structured and semi-structured data, video, audio files, all the things that people tend to call unstructured, which I think of as complex data, because there's clearly structure to that data. It's just complex uh, compared to other data structures. And uh, and they're all working with this these different types of data. And you know, I think a lot of problems have been solved. Uh, you can finally corral your data in one place and make it available to your organization. You know, there's still quite a few issues that are unresolved. Uh, we see the need to build these data applications. People are wanting to incorporate AI into their business. These are the solutions that will be built in the future on top of these platforms. And the platforms are all well situated to be able to add those capabilities on and augment what they, what they can do. There are also data problems that are unsolved uh, and things that I've been focusing on really more than anything else is the unsolved problems in the data stack. And things like graph analysis, are still somewhere between very difficult and in some cases, maybe even impossible for customers to work with. And, and that's a lack of a technology and a set of tools. 
And, you know, of course, one of the issues that I know we're going to get into and what is really becoming very apparent is that the modern data stack needs a semantic layer that sits on top of it, in a sense, to help do governance and understand the, the, what's in the data. And this is going to become progressively more important as these large language models play a bigger and bigger role, because there's a realization across the industry that in order for those models to properly work and give useful answers, they need to be augmented with knowledge of some kind. And we, we believe that knowledge will be will be created probably in the form of knowledge graphs that are that, that are built on top of the modern data stack as a new semantic layer. Okay, uh, let's talk about, I don't know, George, what did you say, the big four, the big five, is it Snowflake, Databricks, Google, with, with BigQuery, et cetera. Microsoft now in the game with Fabric and obviously OpenAI. Uh, George, you and I have talked about uh, AWS. I don't know, George, where you would put, you know, with respect to the likes of Oracle, is that just legacy in your mind? Uh, are there any others that we, we should be talking about, George? Well, my take, especially you know listening to bob is that there's certain requirements which is a sort of a, a data centric foundation that multiple compute engines multiple analytic compute engines can get to and that this data centric foundation needs to eventually cover all data types not just structured and semi structured but the unstructured but that raises this question which is how many data platforms out there can support a data centric foundation and then sort of what's the gateway that manages that is it a full function you know analytic dbms that has a rich transaction model and you know high end interactive performance features or can you get away with a lighter weight sort of execution slash storage engine like the, the Spark execution engine and then have multiple analytic engines work on that data bob why don't you Think to tell us about that, that trade-off. Well, I think what's happening right now is that the the data lakes are maturing. We're in the the next twelve to eighteen months is the period of time where we're going to start to see what I'm going to call at least the maturation of the first generation of the data lakes. And and I think all the vendors are going to move to that sort of an architecture where there is a there are two views on data. To me, really, what a data lake does is it provides two different views. You have a a, a file view of data and you have a table view of data. And some of the challenges we have right now are making sure that those things are coherent, that there is consistent governance across both of those things, and that as data is added, that the transaction model uh, and consistency model is fully understood. And that consistency model will increase in importance as this data is used more, is used for things beyond just business analytics, and it's begin to be used to, to, to actually uh, operationalized systems through data applications. That's where the, the consistency model becomes progressively more important. And in those ways, I think we're still in very immature stages in, in, in the data lake sort of period of the world. But that, that architecture of, of using the underlying file system as the foundation with layers like Hadoop, excuse me, like, like Iceberg or Delta on top, provides a, a foundation to work with the multiple types of data. One of the big challenges today is that blasted two different formats of Delta and Iceberg and potentially Hootie is a third format that is a bit less, less um, in vogue. But the fact that we have a potential beta versus, versus VHS situation is very concerning and problematic to me. Because what it means is that customers, when they're choosing their data lake, you know, they're they're locking themselves into a format. And in some senses, they're locking themselves into at least a set of vendors that operate on that. And that's just something to be very thoughtful about. And I hope that the industry works in the next 18 months or so to reconcile those differences because there's no reason for them. They, they're, they're completely, they, they exist only because of the lineage of the technology, not because there's a need for there to be different solutions. When you so, when you guys when you think about uh, this sort of new type of operational database, maybe maybe question for you, George. I don't know, Bob, if you have an opinion. On it. Why isn't MongoDB in this discussion? That's that's a Bob question. Well, I'm happy to answer it. Look, first let's talk about about you know first let's separate this. What I was talking about before when I was we were talking about the modern data stack, those are that is the part of the data platform that is on the analytics side, and it is when the 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 data lakes or the data warehouse 
are the historical system of record for the business. There's another set of applications that are much more oriented towards working with people on an interactive basis that are operational applications that work with data in its current state, the current state of applications and the things that are going on. You know, now in today's modern IT center, data centers, you know, you, every company has many of these operational applications to run their business. And more and more, those applications are SaaS applications. They're provided by third parties. So you have very little control over that application and what it does. You are able to typically get the data out um, and, and put it into a pipeline and leverage tools like Fivetran to move it into your, into your data lake or data warehouse, your historical system of record. But those systems are totally different. Now, in talking about business, business applications that are operational applications that work with people. The standard for database that people have used for 40 years really is, is a SQL database. And there's a lot of really good reason why people are, have used SQL as a choice for that. In particular, it provides the flexibility that the relational model provides together with very well understood consistent a consistency model that works well for applications that require debit credit style transactions. So there's that whole world that's existed. And the thing that's most interesting about that world is that you work with tables and that's the data structure that SQL is, was designed to work with and is, is optimized for. It's been extended to work with semi-structured data, but it's somewhat awkward to do that. And, and it's fairly rarely used inside most of these operational applications. It's more for, for analysis purposes. Now, what happens is, is that there's classes of applications that that model does not work well for. And we ran head into it at Microsoft when I was, was running the server group and, and we we're trying to move the Exchange product onto SQL Server. There were multiple attempts at Microsoft to move both Exchange and Outlook to SQL Server. Ah, and they you wrote failed. about that in your book, you tell a square they, peg round hole, I think you they called all it. Failed. <laughs> and, and they failed because the data model inside SQL is a, tra is a table. And and it's very static in its nature, and and it has to be very it has to be pre declared, and if you look at a chat session or a mail message, they're very dynamic in the properties they have, how many attachments they've got, et cetera. These things can change on an individual item by item basis, so the data model doesn't fit with the structured table of of SQL, and that's why the NoSQL databases emerged. 15, 12, 15 years ago to handle these sets of issues. And they work quite well, in fact, for applications that are highly dynamic. And in particular, most of them use a consistency model, which is a eventual consistency model, which is also appropriate for something like email where you can operate offline and you want to have multi-master reconciliation and eventually have things come together. But that's very different than a debit credit transaction where you want to make sure both parts of that are done or neither of them done. And the consistency model of today's uh, document in NoSQL databases is by and large problematic for this style of applications because very, very few, in fact, I don't think any of the major document databases support a transaction between what they would call collections. You know, in a document database, instead of storing things in a table, you store it as a semi-structured document mm -hmm. where each level of the tree can have independent properties. And, and those are very dynamic in those databases. And, and the, the, the unit of consistency is typically a document, and they, those are held consistent. But if you have documents in multiple collections, which is similar to what you would have in tables and in a relational join or a relational transaction, um, you can't really support that. Well, what Fauna has done is it's tried to take the best capabilities of every modern operational database, being a serverless database, providing it as, as an API, supporting full global consistency, allowing you to have transactions that span the globe and be totally consistent and be placed really anywhere you want it. And, and yet it, it uses these semi-structured documents, the data model of, of semi-structured documents um, to, to support the application, but it does, does so in a way that is fully relational. So it has the ability to do joins 
between documents and collections, between collections. And it also has the ability to do transactions between collections. So it brings together the best attributes of, of a relational SQL database and the transactional consistency with the data model that people tend to want to work with in operational apps. I mean, if you look, uh, operational apps are written in languages like JavaScript, Java, Python, other applications. They're all object oriented and the native memory model of those are, Im is, are embedded objects, which when serialized looks like a document. In fact, JavaScript serializes into exactly a JSON document. And, and that model is very coherent for applications. And it's very different than what people work with in SQL, which is typically a third normal form and the object relational mappers. I just wrote a blog on this. It just appeared today in the fauna, in the fa on the on fauna. If anyone's interested, um, you can look under the resources and see a blog where I talk about this. It's called uh, "Relational is More Than SQL," and I talk about this from both primarily from the operational database perspective, but then I also mention it from the analytics perspective, because we're seeing the same issues in analytics, where effectively the table. The structure that is the structured data that SQL wants to work with, while appropriate for many, many things, many, many things. I always say, if I wanted to build a new ERP system, and uh, I would, I would use a SQL database underneath that um, for the general ledger. But I might not use it for the marketing system or for the the billing system, where you want much more flexibility in the in the data model, and the dynamicism is very interesting. Uh, th thank well, you for that, well, appreciate it. Go ahead, George. There's a lot let there. Me key, let me key off that because what you're describing is um, an evolution on the operational database foundation that feeds the um, data stack, the modern data stack. But let me, let me try and separate now the concerns. Before we had these little databases that belonged to each microservice. So you really had silos. And the coherence had, at least in the data model, had to come on the analytic data side, on in the modern data stack in the lake house. What you're describing is you could at least have a coherent system of record across all the different microservices, because they could share a one a spanner-like, you know, real-time system of truth. Only it's got the more flexible data model. It's got a, a better transaction model, so the application logic can be more stateless. And but, it's not connection-based, which is really yes. important when you talk about those serverless applications. Yes, and so then let's talk about the other limitations that still remain. You've got this brittle pipeline. Even if you have this coherent system of record that's real-time, you still have to move that into what you call, I think, the historical system of truth on the modern data platform side. Now, um, the, those pipelines, the pipeline that moves that is still brittle because any evolution on one side kind of breaks the other side. And, and you know, we'll talk about potential solutions to that, but that's that's one known limitation. Well, the let other... me stop on that for a second because I, yeah. I do think there's, there's, that, that, there's a point here. So when you're building, when your operational system is, is structured data and the, and the result the result of what you're, you're trying to move across the pipeline is a structured schema, the, you know, it's high, it tends to be highly brittle. But if, if, if you're operating in, in a system that supports dynamic properties, it is actually straightforward to, to, to build the pipeline so that the pipeline can, can sense when a new property has been raised and raise that and, and, and actually you know, uh, indicate to the downstream applications that there's a new property. But it can replicate that property because the output is no longer a table. It's a semi-structured document. Mm -hmm. And so that semi-structured document, if you simply add a property, it does not break the existing things. What it does is it says there's something here you're not making use of. So it's far better than breakage. And, okay. and the fact that it's dynamic, you can because you, you 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 operate in a world where in the case of fauna, you can add this dynamic property. In the downstream side, it would be manifested in the SQL database as a JSON, as a JSON object, which typically is dynamic inside these SQL systems. And then they would typically flatten that. I mean, almost always the first thing you do with the, with JSON uh, for analytics is flatten it into some form of a table. That flattening would not see the new property, but it wouldn't break. Okay. Big difference. Big difference. Okay. That's helpful. Um, 
and then we'll talk about how we might add technology that makes it so that the the um, consuming side actually might understand some of the additions. Well, and Fivetrain has sort of already taken that step because it will populate a catalog of properties. And so if it sees a new property, it'll populate whatever catalog you want. And and so uh, uh, the the arc, the implementation, it's actually not hard to do this. The mechanisms are actually kind of already in place. What's been missing is the is the flexibility in particular of the source databases. Okay. Okay. And this is not going to fix. This is not going to fix the million applications that exist today that don't do it work this way, right? It's it's new applications that will benefit from this, right? And that's going to okay. take some time to develop that base, and and it's not going to be rewrites, no. or maybe a, maybe some of don't that, but it's going to be the sales, new stuff. Salesforce right. is not going to exactly. get rewritten tomorrow. On right. This. They've, right, right, worked, right, they've been trying to rewrite that thing for ten years. <laughs> Keeps but this, bigger. Dave, this feeds into that. Our All right. second set of topics. Yeah, so, so yeah, on. Alex, you want to bring up the next slide if you could. We want to explore how things are changing. We touched a little bit on this with, with Fauna, quite a bit actually, but, and what that new modern data architecture is going to look like. You know, this idea of a digital representation of your business, some people call it a digital twin, uh, new types of databases, uh, similar to what we've been talking about with Bob, relational AI, Fauna, et cetera. Interesting, interested in your thoughts on where AI fits. Bob, how do you see the data stack changing? What are some of the emerging trends that, that you're watching here? Well, first of all, I think that we've matured. I think that the, the data stack has matured in a very fundamental way in working with structured and semi-structured data. And and it's it's actually become pretty effective. I mean, it could it could be better, but it's 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 quite good. And and the biggest area that I would I would still give us a a, a, maybe a C grade on is the simplicity of governance of this solution. Governance is, is to me still the outstanding issue that needs to be addressed more by the industry. And that problem is only exacerbated by the appearance of these data lakes where you have a table view and, and a file view and you need to keep those consistent um, and, and properly governed with only the right access to data. So those are some of the concerns I kind of have today. Um, but the modern data stack is very good at working with structured data. Um, these modern SQL databases, whether it's Snowflake or BigQuery or the new Fabric, I mean, they're good at slicing and dicing data of, of all sorts of sizes. And they've become, you know, effectively a very good kitchen tool to use um, as you're preparing your data meal. And I don't think they're going to go away. I mean, they're going to, they're foundational and they're going to be there for, you know, a decade or two decades, a long, long time. What's, what's obvious to people though, is that there's a lack of semantic information about the data. And you know, even more fundamentally, there's no semantic information or very little information about the business and the business rules themselves. And you know, that is to me the big missing piece of the database. And it's also very directly related to the governance problem. Governance suffers um, from the fact that, that we don't currently have information about our data stored within the modern data stack in a way that's usable. And here the real challenge is that, the, again, I keep coming back to the shape of data. And, and you know, we're so used to working with tables and tables are very good things. They're very functional. You can use them for a lot of things, but they're not good for everything. And as I pointed out earlier, there is there is attributes about operational databases where by working with semi-structured document data models, you can get improvement. In the case of analytics, in particular, um, to try and work with semantics associated with it, you just can't store these semantics in tables. It's just not of an effective structure. You need something much more granular, and that's where this concept of a knowledge graph comes in. The idea that you can create a, a graph of data and represent the data or the business or whatever. You're, the truth is you could represent anything effectively in a knowledge graph. And you would represent that as nodes with properties and then relationships associated with it. And what you discover is that they're very, very complex data structures, much, much too complex to handle in a SQL database. And so uh, I've been working with the team at Relational AI for a little while, and they're building you know, what I think will probably be the world's first relational knowledge graph. And that leverages the underlying relational mathematics um, that, that go beyond what SQL can do to be able to work with data of any shape. And in particular, the way they actually structure data, you know, where Fauna structures data as a document because that's the natural data model for operational applications. 
RAI actually puts data in what's typically called sixth normal form, or what we now think of as graph normal form. It means it's the most it's the most highly normalized you can possibly make data, so that you can work with it and slice it, dice it literally any which way. And relational mathematics provide incredible power to do that, including power to do recursive queries um, where you're going through levels of hierarchy and things like that. And that's all possible to do. Uh, but it requires a whole new set of relational algorithms, and they've been under development, and the team's working hard, and it's you know we have expectations that we'll be out next year with a great product. So, Bob, let me follow up on that, because let's put that in the context of the limitations of of today's data platform and, and what we need to support the intelligent data apps of tomorrow. So if you, you've talked about limitations on governance, so let me try and say, um, like Unity has a, Unity made with Databricks a big splash about heterogeneous data governance and not just data, but all the analytic data artifacts. But one limitation is like you can't represent um, can't represent permissions policy that might be really, might require like deeply nested recursive queries to, to support. Every I don't permission, know. Every permission policy actually requires that. The problem is the, the role, the, if you look at the way roles are structured, groups are structured, it's a hierarchical structure, which means that it's a recursive, it requires a recursive model. Um, this is the challenge, right? I actually think with, I, I think it's great that the Databricks is doing the Unity catalog. I saw that announcement and thought that was a good thing, but it's just a step. It's just a step in the direction. They suffer from the same challenge that everyone else suffers from, which is we don't have an effective way of representing this data model as we sit here in 2023. And that that's what I'm I'm trying to trying to find the limitations of today's approaches. Also, that you can't build um, the shared semantics that then all new data apps would build on for building like an Uber-like app where any you know, object like a fare or, or a rider or a driver needs to be calling on any other app. So maybe tie that into why today's products couldn't, well, I guess you sort of have, but explain how once we have that foundation, how that would make application development, you know, in trans it, it, transformation. It changes everything. I mean, when we, it, when we have a economical usable, uh, relational knowledge graph that takes the power of the relational mathematics and applies it to data of any shape and size, we'll be able to model business for the first time and actually create, you can think of it as a digital twin of the business. Think about your any business, think about your business that you're in and, and, and the business that you're a part of. And, and think about all of the attributes that it takes to run that business. What are the rules? What are the, what, how is the pricing done? all of those attributes, where do those attributes exist? Where does the knowledge of that exist? It exists inside applications, many of which are SaaS applications as we described earlier, so you don't even control it. And you really, it's somewhat opaque what that logic does in most cases. It exists inside programs that maybe you wrote. It exists inside SQL queries and BI tools. It exists in Slack messages, whiteboards, people's heads documents um, and and documents become very interesting because a lot of the stuff is written down, it turns out, because there's a lot of instructions for people. And I actually think, I, I think one of the realizations that I have come to this year is that the root of the enterprise knowledge graph is the documentation that's written in human language, we'll just say English for the moment, um, but it could be any na native human language. Um, and that is the understand that is where most of the understanding of the business is. What we want to do is translate that informal written set of documents into formalized rules that can be can be put into a database in the form of these knowledge graphs that describe exactly what the business is supposed to be doing. Now, you know, eventually, it is possible for those rules to be fully executable and actually run aspects of the business within the database and the knowledge graph because knowledge graphs have the ability, relational knowledge graphs have the ability to execute business logic. But realistically, in today's world where we have dozens of existing systems, we're not gonna replace those things overnight. So I think what we'll wind up doing is defining what the what we want it to be 
and that will become a management tool to ensure that the remain that the organ that all of the components in the organization are operating with the desired behavior that you have. So you design you define essentially the desired behavior inside the knowledge graph and the semantic model. And you know, a system, a governance system will ensure that every part of the organization, the system is actually operating consistently with that. For example, there aren't missing permissions or something like that. Okay, so I was maybe thinking of it the other way where those existing operational systems would feed, and maybe this is what you're saying, feed the knowledge graph, and then I could interact with that knowledge graph, maybe with a natural language you know, interface, ask it questions and get answers to things that today I have to hunt and peck for because it's in Slack or it's in Salesforce or it's in somebody's head or it's in a Google doc. Uh, how do you see these emerging approaches you know, supporting that vision and, well, and what exactly do these new apps exactly look like? Exactly what you just said, Dave, mm -hmm. is, is that once you have this knowledge in a centralized place, you know, it becomes a repository that people can use to understand the business. And, you know, now that we really are, are seeing the breakthrough of the large language models, it's understandable how you could use human you know, language and ask a question and have a model respond. But, you know, you know that, that, that you know, in the world of language models and incorporating those models into enterprises, the current sort of vogue, you know, in vogue thing to do, which is a great thing, you know, is is called RAG, Retrieval Augmented mm -hmm. Generation, you know, where you take corpuses of data, you know, typically one approach that's being widely used right now is to take a tool like Pinecone and vectorize that data mm -hmm. um, in a vector database and then use this. And, and because you now have a semantic representation of it, you when a question is asked, you can query that that source of knowledge and then feed that into the language model for the answer. Well, the other major source, in addition to vectorized data, you know, which is just human language uh, uh, written in in a, in a written form that's that's turned into semantic semantic vectors. In addition to that, the other place where these models will be getting augmentation is from knowledge graphs. And in a way, it's the first place that happened. If you look, you know, Google has been doing this to some extent for years in search. You know, Google has a knowledge graph that it shows you whenever you ask about a company or a place, what it shows you is the knowledge graph of what it knows about that place. And now what the, these, these, these search engines are doing is they're incorporating that knowledge into their language models. And so that can be used to answer questions in a more accurate way. So Bob, yeah, let me you know the reason I on. the reason George, just to decide, part of the reason I was asking about Mongo, one is you know we talk about operational new operational databases and document databases, but we actually built Bob and George the Cube AI. So we took all thirty five thousand uh, uh, interviews and videos that we've had done over the last ten years. They've, we've always transcribed them, and we built this retrieval augmented generation, this RAG system that uses Mongo, it uses Milvis, it doesn't use Pinecone, um, and you can ask it a question, it'll give you an answer, it'll give you actually clips of where that answer came from. It'll actually generate clips automatically, but I would think that over time, I, I, I could- uh, Is that working of, pretty well? Is that working pretty well? It, it, it's working, it's really interesting. You go to the thecubeai.com, and it's in private beta, it does hallucinate. Like if you ask it, like what does Bob Muglia think about the future of uh, uh, data apps? It'll give you an answer and it'll give you clips. It'll, it'll maybe say some things that you didn't say, <laughs> um, but it's a really well written answer. And so we're, for, we're, we're tuning that, but my thinking is that- You can tune that down, you can tune that oh, down. Absolutely, yeah, and we're well, doing that with all the, you know, we're getting great feedback from the private beta. But it, it would seem to me that you could consolidate a lot of that around what, what today for us is Mongo. I would think we could do some, whether it's vector search or even maybe extended, or what you're talking about with some of the future platforms to really simplify. But I mean, we built this app, Bob, in literally weeks and have it in, had it into an MVP and it was very inexpensive to do. So it just blows your mind as what's, what, what's possible. That's what's sort of here. exciting. That's what is really exciting about the, this new generative AI and what we've seen in the last year. I, I mean, I'm so excited about it because for the first time, there is a way to effectively bottle intelligence, to take the knowledge about, about a subject and actually put, put that intelligence 
that what it's required to make that work inside one of these models. And and the tools are still rather crude for doing that, but they're improving at a very fast pace and the mm -hmm. models are improving. It's it's a very, very exciting time. But but what is very clear is it's the combination of that intelligence that the model provides together with knowledge in some form that is going to make these things work really well. I mean, I personally have found that I've moved, you know, uh, you know, ChatGPT is great, but I like tools that are much more up to date. And, you know, right. I've been using perplexity to, to, to answer questions and it's pretty cool. The answers you can get, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's current, you know, these things are up to date and we're going to start to see more and more consumer and business oriented solutions that leverage this technology. Yeah. Sorry, George, I took a little turn yeah. there. Well, let me let me follow up on that because Dave was talking about using, you know, a large language model on top of like an existing um, data base. And my question is now let's extend that to we have a, a relational knowledge graph that represents a model, a coherent model of the business. And then underneath it organizes all the historical system of truth. Now I have two questions. First, can you use an LLM not not a raw LLM, but a, one as a development assistant, a co-pilot, a coding co-pilot to help you build these digital twin applications on top of that system of truth. That's that's my first question. Would it accelerate the ability to, you know, build these apps? Yes, is the short answer. And in fact, it's super important because one of the learnings we've had as we've built relational AI is it's really hard for people to build these digital twins and to think in terms of these semantic layers. It's not, we've not really been trained, most of us at least have not been trained to do it. The people that are the most trained are the business analysts that are really focusing on, you know, understanding the processes associated with a business. There are people that are, and they're often consultants that you hire, and, and they tend to think this way, but it's not something that most people learn as they're, you know, when they were in college or when they're in their early formative days. So it's tough for people to kind of get that. That, And I think these language models will be very helpful. I also do think that we're going to just start to train people differently. I think that, the, you know, that, that we'll begin in the next few years to, to talk much more about declarative programming. And, and, you know, we do, everybody does it. People learn imperative programming today where you take one step, then you take another. One of the attributes of these knowledge graphs is that, you know, you're not declaring you do this first, you do this first, you do that. You declare rules, business rules, and the system determines the order that things happen based on the data that it has. And that's a very different way of working with things. But you said something really important in there, which is the people closest to that mindset of business rules are the business analysts. But there used to be a skills gap between the language they spoke and translating that into code for applications. And the LLM can help map the business rules that a business analyst understands down into a more domain specific language like RHEL or whatever you're- I think the LLMs are helping today with imperative languages too. I mean, yes. we've seen the co-pilots be one of the most effective, you know, the, 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 the developer co-pilots is one of the most effective first generation uh, AI solutions. And and I you know I think we'll continue to see that, but uh, but it is a shift again to move to much more declare to much more declarative way of, of describing things. So I got to take another tangent here, George. While you're thinking about the next sort of vector, you go. I asked the Cube AI, Bob and George, what does Bob Muglia think about the future of data apps? I'm going to read you the answer. I'll maybe Listen try to said. paraphrase. Bob Muglia believes that the future of data apps lies in a shift from a code first approach to a model driven approach. He emphasizes the importance of companies like DBT Labs in incrementally building on the modern data stack and adding a semantic layer that describes the data. Muggly envisions a world where organizations define models first of their data and ultimately of their entire business. He sees this as a major change in the way we think about writing applications rather than writing code to produce APIs that encapsulate data. Muggly believes that organizations will define models that encapsul encapsulate their business rules, logic, and data. He acknowledges APIs will continue to be useful and play a significant role, but organizations will increasingly focus on defining models to drive their applications. He suggests in the next 10 years, organizations will move toward this model-driven world where models define both data and business process. This shift is supported by the developments in machine learning and the increased use of learning models, 
learned models and applications. He also highlights the need for infrastructure that can handle both these learned models and explicitly define models with re relational knowledge graphs playing a key role. Overall, he believes that the integration of data and AI is inevitable and that data apps will become closer as AI technology advances. I don't know, Bob, how would you Pretty rate good. that? Good, I, I, I could have said that. I, I could have said that. I mean, it sounds <laughs> like I said that. It's, then, it sounds then, like it's repeating a bunch of things I did say, in fact. <laughs> and then it gives me, it. Get, but the interesting thing, the really cool thing is it gives me, you know, many clips where you're references. quoted in references. references with actual clips and snippets. So that's of, the cool thing. And yeah. that's what these models, that's what, you know, these more, augmented models and you know we see it in the consumer search applications like bing or perplexity or bard things like that where you have references to the to the real to the the underlying content which is incredibly helpful if you want to dive deeper i i mean it's a totally different way of working with information i don't know about you but my entire search my entire approach to internet search has changed completely this year. Totally different. I oh, ask a model first. Hundred percent, absolutely. I mean, and uh, and uh, you know, I'll use these tools to just make myself more productive. I, I can, I could do a lot more breaking analysis with with thing, things you like find AI. Find stuff out so much faster. It's you know, it reminds me. It's at least as big of a transition as the internet was, where you know, it used to be you had to go to a library and stuff to find this these this stuff out. I mean, I remember those days, and right. now. You know. <laughs> But Bob, let's let's talk a little bit about trying to extend today's data stack to support these this new class of applications and what that pathway might look like. So you might companies might start marking up the semantics of their data with BI metrics. Like that's an easy first step. Mm -hmm. Can that support growing into full application semantics? And if there might be limitations in that growth path how might customers sort of make that first step and then transition to something broader if necessary? Well, it is a good first step and people should do it. And, and, and people have been doing it, frankly, in BI layers for a very long time. This is nothing, this is nothing new. I mean, Cognos, I think, you know, this was one of their big things years, you know, business objects. I think they were talking about this ages and ages ago. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, the it is a good step. I, I think that getting to those full semantics is going to require, I, I continue to say that we need the database to underlie it. I, you know, this week I've talked to two or three different really small companies that are looking at collecting data semantics, you know, and I ask them, where are you storing it? And they tell me they're storing it in a YAML file. And I go, okay, that's not a bad first place to store it, but it's not a long-term repository. And obviously it's just not going to scale. The problem you have is you can operate at really small scale with just working with files, but you eventually have to be able to put these in something where you can work with the data through, you know, on much more normal relational commands. Okay, following that up. So I'm just focusing on fixing the underlying infrastructure. That's and, my and, thing. I got to get the infrastructure right. You know, the whole modern data stack couldn't exist until Snowflake demonstrated that it was possible to build a system that could work with structured and semi-structured data at any scale. I mean, and, and, and until we demonstrate using SQL, until we demonstrated that, you know, nobody believed it was possible. This is likewise, we need a new generation of technology and databases to be able to move the world forward. And we're just waiting for them to finish. They're very well, much, they're very much underway. Okay, along those lines, where might someone get into trouble, like a, like a Databricks or a Snowflake or Microsoft, if they try to start modeling richer semantics than just BI metrics and, and their dimensions? Where, where do they hit the wall? And then what would you layer on top if you they had to- They hit the wall on queries. They hit the wall on complex queries. You know, interestingly, uh, people are tending to use, I mean, there's two types of databases that people are tending to use to store this in today's world. They're using either a graph database like Neo or Tiger, Neo4j or Tiger, or they're trying to use a document database and, and store it. Because it, if you think about these properties, they actually, they actually mo most closely, although it's not a hierarchy, it, it is a graph, it truly is a graph, you know, a graph is effectively in a, is a more com a hierarchy is a subset of a graph essentially. So leveraging documents makes some sense. But here again, they hit the issues of transactional consistency unless they're using fauna, and um, and then you know, query is not that powerful. I mean, query is 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 much much more restricted in these systems, and and so that's where they tend to hit it. You know, I keep saying the problem everyone has, the problem customers have always wanted me to solve 
which nobody can solve today is, you know, Fred Smith was just terminated by the company. He was turned off. I mean, Okta, we, you know, Okta or whatever, they turned him off. He has no access. Before he left, what data did he have access to? It's very hard to answer that question. Very, very hard to answer that question. Okay, that's um, on the, the a governance challenge. Tell us about the the expressiveness and the richness of the semantics that you have in in BI metrics layers, and then where you might have to go beyond what they can do. What, ha what happens is, is that if you start modeling, if you start looking at the models of these semantics and the relationships that exist between the data elements, they become a graph. It just becomes a graph very quickly. And so, you know, now you have the question is, how are you going to store that graph? And that's why I say you can use a bespoke graph database like Neo4j and, and, you know, it will work to a point. Um, uh, the challenge that these things to have are scale oriented challenges and largely because they are not relational in their, in their, in their construct. Um, and, and they're, they're, they, they use pointers essentially. And, and so, you know, to scale that becomes very, very difficult. Um, or they, you know, people use, you know, try and use SQL. They, you know, a lot of people try and do something with Postgres, but, you know, they hit brick walls with that. It's the classic issue you hit with database technology when the technology has not matured. And it's generally speaking, when the relational technology is not matured to hit, to, to solve a business problem, people try and solve it with the existing things, but it is like hitting your head against a brick wall. You know, I remember this is the way it was, you know, in the, in the early 19, in the late seventies, early 1980s, when I first entered the, the workforce and we were working with hierarchical and network databases, they were a bear to work with, you know, and SQL made everybody's life so much easier mm -hmm. and it will continue to make people's lives so much easier, except for these problems where SQL doesn't address like these highly, um, uh, complex relationships that graph oriented problems and metadata, it turns out semantic layers is one of the most interesting problems. There are many other problems, by the way, in business that model as graphs. The chemical, chemical industry has a lot of problems that look like this. So a lot of data problems need to be solved by graph that are not management and semantic models. But, but, you know, the one that to me hits everyone is the semantic model. Hey, so, uh, so let's, Guys, we gotta we gotta wrap up here, George. Go ahead, one one more, and then uh, I'm gonna, well, I, gonna, I, uh, I wanted to say, you know, once we, I wanted to ask about once we have this this semantic foundation and the richly connected data for both, you know, all the governance services, but also the essentially the application logic now and definitions that are shared across all apps. You talked at one point about um, documents containing the semantics and the rules of a business. What might these end-to-end -end applications look like when you captured the document flows? Like, so the what was unstructured, but really now LLMs can pull the structure out of those documents and they're part of applications that span what were office workflows, but they also have operational capabilities in them. And you have this new stack, what can you build? So I think you're going to, I think what you're going to build first and foremost is the governance and management layers that lets you understand the organization. And then I think from that, you're going to begin to derive applications that you can build that are focused on given areas and take on some parts of your business. You know, if you look at, again, you have SaaS applications that are running your operations, some bespoke applications, you have this modern data stack that you've just, that you, you are deploying or you've just deployed and, and you're running with. And those aren't going to go away. None of that stuff's going to change. You're not going to get rid of that stuff tomorrow. It's stuff's in there for a long time. So what you do is you augment it with systems that that focus on solving problems you can't solve. And that'll first work on, on you know, I think the governance thing. But then I think we'll begin to use these knowledge graph databases to build data applications themselves. And, you know, we talked about this a little bit before the show. We haven't had a chance to get into it too much during the discussion. But one of the interesting things is what is the consistency model of the analytic data. And this is we, focusing on transactional consistency is incredibly important in data. And it's particularly important if you want to operationalize that data, if you want to actually take action based on that data. You know, the, the consistency model kind of can work out itself out if you're looking historically over time. But if you're looking at data that's coming in and trying to, in near real time, make decisions of what to do, 
keeping that data consistent is very important. And that's why understanding the consistency model is critical. Uh, an analytic database uses a snapshot level typically of consistency, which means each table is consistent in itself, but it, it isn't necessarily consistent between the tables at the same time. And that's why some of these systems start talking about using uh, technology like strictly serialized, which is a much easier model to work with in building applications. And today products like Materialize support that as an operational data warehouse. And I think more and more that's gonna be important. It turns out that that relational AI and what they're building with the knowledge graph is actually strictly serialized. And that's very important because those that, that system will be used to build applications. And, and again, having that high level of consistency is very important. So this is something people don't pay enough attention to. And it's it's really important, really important. So Bob, last question, two part question. So this, this notion of Uber for all that we've been putting forth, do you, do you buy that premise and how, how long, if you, if so, how long will, do you think it will take to, to unfold? Well, I, I do in the sense that, I mean, for all is a big word, right? I mean, Uber is a very complicated SaaS application. There's many, many complicated things, frankly, that some don't require. I mean, it has complexity that many companies may not require, although certainly many other companies do. And you know, if you look at in any kind of transportation industry, et cetera, they have very, very similar sets of requirements. It's getting a lot easier to build these things. Um, you know, there are components that you still have to stitch together. I think over time, more and more of them will be incorporated into the modern data stack platforms that let people do it. You know, in addition to the things we've been talking about today, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, before we started that one of the one of the tools that that came out of Uber that that turns out to be very critical for that style of application is 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 something to support long running transactions. If you think about what an Uber driver has to do, they you know, they call to pick up a, a client, they pick them up, they go through a route, they go through the stages, they finish it. That is is thought of in Uber as a long running transaction. And you know the tools that Uber developed uh, uh, were open sourced, and now the company that is is that support that is now driving that forward is called Temporal, and they build a system to help support that transaction system. Again, it comes back, and I'll say this again, to consistency levels. Uber understood the importance of transactional consistency, which is why they built the underlying foundation that is ultimately in Temporal today. And, and, and you need that level of consistency within your, your application and database systems. And Uber even went so far as to build these long running transaction systems, um, which are now available for others to use. Okay, so not everybody needs that level of capability, but something like that people, places, and things that representation of your business. Is that a decade long sort of journey? Well, it's shorter or? than that. I think it's much shorter than that. The, you know, the fact is, is that what, the biggest criticism I think everyone has today, and it's a good criticism, is, is that the modern data stack has a lot of components to make it successful. Mm -hmm. And you have to buy things from a lot of people. Over time, those things will tend to consolidate into the platforms. Um, and that will change, say, over the next five years. But but the thing that's interesting is the pieces are there today, by and large, with the exception that I keep coming back to to these to the knowledge graph, which is still a missing component. The pieces are by and large there together to build these solutions today. Awesome, Bob Muglia, always a great guest. To thank you so much, the datapreneurs. If you want to go deeper into into Bob's head and his life and his perspectives, definitely pick up a copy. Thanks so much for your time, and thank you, George. Thanks a lot. Thanks. All right, appreciate you watching. This is Dave Vellante for Breaking Analysis and we'll see you next time.